Hi everybody, Pastor Cliff here at Grace Community Church in Surprise, Arizona. So glad you could tune in for our lessons in Nehemiah. I believe this is the sixth lesson that we've been able to glean from this marvelous book on leadership and uh, God's faithfulness and our need to return that faithfulness to him uh, and, and live that out. Nehemiah is just a spectacular uh, leader, both spiritually and physically. He didn't separate the two concepts, but that's another question for philosophers to deal with. Even so, I think you get my drift. He was a hands-on kind of a leader. He wasn't just one of these guys who sits around and thinks great thoughts. He put things in action. And those are the kind of leaders that we need today both in our government and in the church. Actually, that's the kind of leader we always need, are people who are willing to take action, to act on God's word. So we're getting to chapter four, and we've just been through chapter three, which is an amazing chapter. It's a long one. It's a hard one to read because of all the different names. But Nehemiah is appreciating the people who worked on the wall and, uh, and helped to rebuild this wall. And uh, they're right in the midst of it as we get to chapter 4. And they begin to experience opposition. And we're going to get to see how Nehemiah deals with these very annoying people that want to destroy the work of God and the work of the people of Israel on rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. So, as we get started, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time together. We pray that you would make our time in your word effective and meaningful, and that we would live out lives that have been influenced by your word, your will, and your way, uh, so that we might be your light and your love in uh, the presence of everyone who we encounter. We want to glorify you and we want to honor you. So we pray that you would help us to do just that as we study your word now. For we pray this in the precious and powerful name of Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, all right, friends, here we are. Uh, we begin with verse 1. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry. Remember, Sanballat was, um, he wasn't one of the people of Israel. He was one of those um, guys that took advantage of the Israelites when all of the, when all of the leaders and the craftsmen and the, the people who had any skills, uh, any education were carried off in the Babylonian exile, the people who were uh, handicapped, elderly, infirm, unable to travel, too small, whatever, they were left behind and the walls were in shambles. And so guys like this uh, uh, Sanballat came along and they took advantage of people. So they were making money. They had power over the people of Israel, or at least the remnant that was left. And so he's really ticked off that his uh, honey pot has been taken away from him. This is what he says in the process. Um, now, when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. Again, there's that mockery. It's the cheapest way to attack people. And he said in the presence of his brothers in the, of the army of Samaria, uh, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they, they restore it for themselves? Uh, will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, is, uh, he, the sidekick of Sambalat, says, uh, uh, was beside him and said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break it down. Uh, he'll break their, down their wall. Here are, here are, uh, here, O oh God, uh, for we are despised. This is, this is interesting. Um, this is kind of the response that we have to the mockery of Sambalat and Tobiah. Um, so yeah, you, let, me, let me just pause. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. Uh, you have, you have these mockers uh, that are, are all about, uh, 
destroying the work of the Israelites because they don't want their honeypot taken away. They, they're able to take advantage of people any which way. And so they use this mockery. I just want to turn over to Psalm 1 for a moment, moment and remind you of the kind of people that are godly. Listen to this, Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers, or scoffers rather, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Friends, we need to be so careful of how we use uh, mockery and how we uh, attack one another um, with ridicule. Uh, that's not necessarily of the Lord. We have to be so careful of it. Um, but that's the tool that Sanballat and um, Tobiah used. And then you have this response, um, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builder, of the builders. Oh, wow. So you have this ridicule, you have this resistance, uh, ridicule in verses 1 and 3, resistance in verse 6, you've got uh, rumor mongering in verse 11, that's coming. Um, but what Nehemiah does is he prays, he asks the Lord for help in the face of these people who are, are trying to discourage um, the people of Israel. What, is, what does this kind of stuff do? It fatigues people. It, it, it frustrates them. Uh, they begin to feel like failures. They, they begin to th think of, of fear instead of success. And so Nehemiah's response in verses 4 and 5 is basically, hey, we're going to rely on God. We're not going to listen to the opposition. We're, not, we're paying no mind to them. Um, we're going to well, let's read on here uh, and find out what happens. So, um, you know, Nehemiah is calling on the strength and power of the Lord. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. This is, they're moving fast. They're working hard. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites uh, heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. So, yeah, I mean, you, you had uh, Nehemiah praying, but he also provided protection. He also set a guard. He, if you have, uh, it's one thing if you close your door at night, um, but friends, you're welcoming trouble if you don't lock it. Oh, well, we just trust God, you know. There's a reason why we have locks on doors, and, um, and, and God wants us to use wisdom. So Nehemiah uses wisdom. And uh, I think it's also interesting that um, when, when you have people like Tobiah and Sambalat and Geshem, they're around the edges and they're spreading rumors and they're spreading lies and they're they're trying to discourage people that can really begin to infect people pretty quickly uh, when you're surrounded by people who are saying stuff like that so uh, Nehemiah didn't want to allow that to continue uh, so he sets this guard uh, as a protection against them day and night and verse 10 says in Judah it was said the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. See, the people are already starting to believe some of the rumors and lies. 
There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them uh, came from all directions, see that? Um, and, and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in, it, in uh, open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid. Be not afraid uh, of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So in other words, get a trowel in one hand, a spear in the other hand, and be prepared to fight, friends. This is all out. You know what? When we look at, at repairing our economy after this coronavirus, and I don't know how much of that was real. Obviously, there was a virus that's, that's horrible and we don't like it, but how much that was played up by politicians to manipulate us, I don't know. Uh, but my suspicions tell me that there was a bunch of that. And I think repairing our economy is equally significant, if not more significant. And there are those who would love to see our economy destroyed. Well, we've got to um, both uh, battle and build, friends. We have to be wise and we have to be ready to fight uh, for our country. And, uh, and, but most of all, we need to be trusting the Lord, seeking the Lord. And that's not a passive thing. Trust me. It's not a passive thing. So, um, Nehemiah says, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So he's very wise in appealing to the need to protect your loved ones. But he's also much more wise in saying, It's God who gives you the power. It's God who gives you the strength. And then in verse 15, when our enemies heard that, it was known, heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on con construction and half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who surrounded the trumpet, uh, or I'm sorry, the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So they knew that they had some weaknesses, but they also knew that as they, as they called on the Lord, as they sounded the trumpet, they would all come together and fight for what is right and what is good. And that's what we need in our country today. And that's what we need in our churches today. People who will come together and fight for what is right, for what is good, for what God has blessed us with. Not because we're trying to beat other people up, not because we're trying to, to, to make a mess of the world, but because we love, we, we, we love the Lord and we love what he stands for. We love his kind of righteousness and not the, the kind of so-called righteousness you find in the secular humanists who say, God is no higher than my heart. That's silly stuff. Okay, let's finish this chapter out. So, mm, so the man who sounded the trumpet and was beside me 
the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. There we go. And I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from, the, from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Again, we got to rally together, friends. We're a team. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at the, that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. There you have it. Nehemiah was with the people, for the people. He fought side by side with them. He built side by side with them. He was concerned for the well-being of Jerusalem and the people therein. Praise be to God for leaders who care about the people entrusted to them. Nehemiah was a good under-shepherd. I hope you and I will be good under-shepherds too as we serve within the church, within our communities, and within our nation. Well, friends, that's the end of chapter 4. There's so much more that we could talk about, but uh, we'll get to that the next time we tune in where we get to chapter 5. I think that's our seventh lesson in Nehemiah. I could be off a little bit, but that's no surprise. Um, We're going to find in chapter 5 this marvelous uh, place where Nehemiah talks about uh, the oppression of the poor and what our response should be to that and and our need for, for generosity. And what a great chapter it will be. I look forward to, to our next meeting together. In the meantime, I would uh, urge you to keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus, the lover of your soul, the one who uh, keeps his eye upon the sparrow and how much more he keeps his eye upon you. I love you. And uh, most of all, God loves you. So, I look forward to our next meeting. In Jesus' name, amen.